You are listening to the Digital Parent Podcast with your host, Sed Lewis. Hey parents, welcome to another episode of the Digital Parent Podcast. On today's episode, we have one of the hottest authors on the market, Nancy Jo Sills, with her outstanding book called American Girls, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers. And Nancy has been featured all over the place. She's been interviewed by Good Morning America, The View, multiple other outlets. And the reason she's such a hot guest to get is because this book is so outstanding. It covers interviews for over 200 girls across 10 different states over a 30-month period. And she, in the book, she covers topics such as cyberbullying, the sexualization of girls on social media, the porn industries, fight clubs, slut clubs. And we really, on this episode, get into all those subjects with Nancy. So before we get directly into the interview, a quick word from our sponsor, Inspire. Parents, M-Spy is the ultimate monitoring tool for all devices. M-Spy remotely tracks GPS locations, calls, text, messages, WhatsApp, Snapchat, web browsers, pictures, and much more. With Inspy, you can also restrict unwanted calls, block websites, or even block apps. Go to mspy.com for more information. Hey, Nancy, welcome to the uh, Digital Parent Podcast. We're so happy to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, we love your book, American Girls, and we want to jump right into it. And one of the things that's unique about your book, Nancy, is that you interviewed, you know, so many girls across the globe. How many girls did you interview in all for your book? I spoke to over 200 girls in 10 states, including New York, Florida, Virginia, Kentucky, Texas, California. I spoke to girls of all Races, sexual orientations, gender identities, socioeconomic backgrounds. And I did it for about two and a half years. So what was like the one thing that you got from interviewing all those girls when it came to social media? Um, We hear all the time about how wonderful social media is. And, you know, the narrative that's coming out of Silicon Valley is all about the the wonderful transformative changes that are happening because of cell phones and apps and digital communication. Um, and this is sort of, of, uh, you know, what, what, what the public relations people of these tech companies are telling us. And at this point, I think it's, it's so such a pervasive view of it that I would almost call it propaganda, but I really heard a different story talking to girls and so similar some of the dysfunction that's going on was so similar that even across different states and across, uh, you know, different socioeconomic lines, I would hear stories that were almost the same and almost using the same words. Um, And I think that's because the platforms are the same. You know, Facebook is Facebook in California or New York. Snapchat is Snapchat in Baton Rouge or Boca Raton or, you know, Louisville, Kentucky. So, these platforms demand a certain kind of engagement, I think. And what I found for girls in particular, sometimes this is very, very challenging. It's very image-based. There's a lot of emphasis on how, how you look, um, whether or not you're sexy or hot. Um, there's a pressure to be uh, beautiful, to be perfect, to have a certain body type. And uh, there's this kind of pressure to get validation through other people's, you know, um, validating you through other people telling you, you are these things, you are perfect, you are beautiful, you're gorgeous, you're sexy, you're hot. So for girls who are at the stage where they are, you know, just coming of age, just coming, you know, just dealing with new, new, a new way of being, they're getting, they're growing up, they have new bodies, new faces, you know, sometimes Sometimes you look in the mirror. I remember as a kid from day to day, and you actually look different. Who am I kind of stuff? And here, suddenly, with this new technology, they have to be public, and they have to present a public self. And not only present a public self, but make that public persona popular, because the popular the popularity contest that has always been part of high has migrated onto these phones. So I heard a lot about pressure. I heard a lot about... Um, confusion, anxiety, sometimes depression, and uh, all, all kinds of, all kinds of uh, 
upset. I heard about problems that were happening with friends and, you know, communications and miscommunications that happen because you're talking from behind a screen instead of in person. So when these girls were going through these issues, um, were, th- were there any conversation with their mothers at all? Or, or did they kind of like, you know, it was like a silo, it was kind of like a teenage thing where they didn't feel that their parents, because they weren't digital natives, would understand what they were going through? It's really interesting you should say that. I've, I've, um, the other night I was giving a talk at a school in New Jersey, and uh, one of the parents raised her hand in the, in the talk, and she said, you know, one really striking thing about your book is where are the parents? You know, there's all these really intense and sometimes very dramatic things happening in these girls' lives. And the book is about boys as well. I mean, you kind of can't get away from the interaction between girls and boys anyway in a school situation in any community. But at the same time, the book is also a lot about uh, sexualization and sexual harassment that goes on online. So this mother said, you know, where are the parents? And, you know, that's a very good question. Sometimes there are some parents in the book. And in particular, there's one conversation between a parent and a daughter who, a mother and a daughter, who were very close and did talk about social media. And I wanted to include that to show how how great a conversation like that can go, how how involved the mother can be, and how she can uh, be there as a sounding board for her daughter and to guide her daughter. But for the most part, these were things that were going on in what girls described to me as a second world. You know, it's almost as if it was a different place that their parents didn't know about and really couldn't go to. And sometimes there were cases where girls were having terrible problems to the point of, uh, in extreme cases, suicide attempts, and the parents had no idea what was going on until these very dramatic outcomes would occur. Why don't they know? I think it's a combination of things. One, I think it's denial. Uh a certain kind of neglect, you know, not a malevolent neglect, but it just sort of a, a neglect out of not really realizing the the potential for problems, you know, and just sort of thinking like, oh, well, here's a phone. Of course, you're just going to use it to chat with your friends and do homework and, uh, you know, play games, not really realizing the dangers, uh, denial because of just resisting and not wanting to think that such things as described in the book by these girls are possible. And also, I think kids hide things. I mean, I don't. I'm I'm on the side of kids. I I'm I'm their biggest supporter and and want them to. Uh, I don't ever want to like you know blame them for anything that's going on. They're children, but let's face it, they they are teenagers, and so they do hide things. They don't want their phones taken away, and they're afraid that if they tell about certain things that are going on, particularly as involves. Um, Sex, things of a sexual nature or sexuality, they're, they're afraid they're, they'll get their phones taken away. They're maybe ashamed or embarrassed to talk about it. And sometimes they tell me that they don't want their parents to worry. They don't want, you know, they don't want to put that burden on their parents of them being worried about them. You know, that's interesting because I think just last week, the young girl, Tavana Holton, who um, committed suicide based on some bullying that was taking place, I think there were some leaked Snapchat uh, videos of her uh, being nude, and once it got out, um, she allegedly she shot herself in the in the brain because of it. And one of the things I found that was interesting when the authorities talked to her mom or her aunt, they stated they they were never aware of anything called Snapchat. They had never heard of the app before, or they were never aware that these kids were having these conversations online until something bad really happened. It's kind of like what you just said. Sometimes kids keep secrets or don't want their parents involved or some heavy topics that may be taking place in their life. I was so, I was so saddened by the story of Tavana Holton. I mean, I'm always sad when I read about these, these stories, which uh, were the impetus for this book. We, we at the magazine where I work, Vanity Fair started talking about what is going on in the lives of kids, particularly girls that we are seeing all of these extreme Stories. Now, this is going back to 2013 when I did the first story on this uh, social media and girls, which became the book. There had been Steubenville sexual assault posted online. Um, Amanda Todd in Canada who killed herself after an uh, older man screenshot a naked picture of her. What is going on? Is this just something that 
is, uh, you know, the, are these extreme cases or is this indicative of something that's more widespread? And these stories haven't stopped. And even since my book has come out, uh, we've seen one every few weeks. There was Tavana. There was uh, Destiny. I forget her last name. I'm sorry. In Missouri, killed herself. 14 years old. Tavana was 15. 14-year-old Destiny in Missouri killed herself after not even a naked picture of her, but a pic- a naked picture of just some anonymous random person that kids in her school said was her and that said that she had sent around was posted. There was uh, Nicole Lovell in um, Virginia who was kidnapped and raped and we believe raped and, and killed by uh, older teenagers who met her on Kick Messenger, an anonymous chat site. I mean, this is getting to be almost routine, these types of stories, and it really shouldn't be routine. Now, how does this affect my kid or your kid? Well, because now it's become our cultural landscape. It's now the atmosphere of social media. And I can tell you from talking to these hundreds of girls and some boys in my book that these are extreme outcomes, but they are indicative of a wider culture that is in almost every school I went to, almost every community. There are things, for example, called slut pages where non-consensually shared pictures of usually girls are put up on a page on Facebook or Instagram, usually by boys, not always, but usually um, non-consensually shared naked pictures are sent around and the whole school sees them or, you know, the whole community, the whole baseball team, you know, whatever. So this is, this is American culture now. Not every girl is going to kill herself over this, but many of them feel like they would like to, that this happens to. 50% in a recent study of women and girls who've had this happen to them contemplate suicide. Um, it's a terrible, it's a, it's a terrible thing. So and are- even, if, even if it's not, just one last thing on that, even if it's not happening to your daughter, She's in this atmosphere where she knows this can happen to others, where she's seen it happen to others. There's an atmosphere of a kind of threat. And it's just, uh, I feel, the scourge that we've got to start to deal with. Do you think the, the issue, Nancy, is, um, you know, when it comes to communities and schools, there's a, like a lot of uh, lectures, there are a lot of meetings about, you know, apps and, and, you know, things that kids shouldn't be doing online and taking away technology. But do you think that's a part of the problem that people are missing the culture that's taking place? Because I don't, I don't know if people are in tune. I don't know if parents are in tune to the culture behind the technology. It's all about, okay, I'm going to get you off Facebook or you can't use this app or that app and not paying attention into what's the culture among the teenagers that's actually leading to the behavior. It's a cultural problem. These are just devices, you know. I mean, they do enable us to do things that we could never do before. We could never take pictures and send them instantly around. We could never communicate instantly with, with people far away. These, this, the technology enables all of these things, but it really is the culture behind the technology that is driving all of, all of this dysfunction and uh, sometimes cruelty and sometimes worse, sometimes crime, you know, I mean, it is, um, Again, a very extreme example, but I think it's it's a, an educational one in this context that we're talking about. Brock Turner, the campus rapist, um, as uh, during his crime, one of the things that he did, uh, shockingly and horribly, was he took a picture of his victim's breasts and sent them to a friend. And the friend wrote back, um, who's, you know... Uh, dis- de- degrading word for breasts are these, are those. And we know this because of court documents. Okay, so rapists did not start with cell phones and social media. We, there's, there's sadly always been rape. But the fact, I thought this was a very important thing to note about this crime, the fact that during, during this crime, this young man wanted to take a trophy of this girl's body parts and send it to a friend as a kind of gloating, triumphant thing. This is so important to note in terms of seeing that what's being expressed on these phones and, and in, this, in this 
you know, miasma of, of dysfunction in which we find ourselves is misogyny. I mean, social media is a place where there's a lot of racism being expressed. There's a lot of misogyny being expressed. There's a lot of hate. And I think that the, it, the technology has accelerated and exacerbated the, um, the way in which these things get expressed. It's a kind of a mob mentality sometimes. And I think that's one of the interesting. It, I, I think ahead. one of the interesting things you talk about in your book is about you know the notion of masculinity, and I think in that case you just talked about with boys. It seems that you know these pictures become some type of like social commodity. So if I have these pictures in my, you know, uh, in my possession, then you know that becomes a commodity to other males to show them like, hey, I'm that guy. You know, I'm that you know sexual male where. I have all these pictures to it changed and it, it feeds within that masculine culture of, you know, you know, men being, you know, sexually dominant and by through the collection of all these pictures that they're asking for from these young that, teenage girls. That's exactly right. And that's why when you hear people say, and some people do say, Oh, well, sexting, it's just a new kind of flirting. It's just like the new kind of, um, you know, flirting that kids do. And if you don't get it, you're just old. And it's, that's just not unfortunately the case. I mean, I wish it were, but, uh, children, teenagers taking naked pictures of each other, first of all, is by our definition of our laws, child pornography, number one. And number two, these pictures are not, not used in an intimate context between two people. I mean, even if they were, I think there would be things that as parents, we need to uh, really question as adults question whether this is healthy or quote unquote normal, because I mean, how can it be normal when it's only existed for a few years? How do we know what normal is at this point or how, what effect it's going to have on them, on their, on their fantasy life, on their view of each other as human beings, you know, to, to reduce each other at this very early stage to a, a naked photograph, number one, but number two, it doesn't always, end with that person it gets on someone's phone it's not always just seen as like a an intimate exchange like a uh you know something private it's it's not private at all it's on a cell phone it's on a server somewhere it belongs to others if it's on snapchat it belongs to this company snapchat you know they they keep all of these pictures forever and ever so i mean do you really want uh, you know, this is a hypothetical here. Do you really want Snapchat to own naked pictures of your daughter or, or son for that, re for that matter? You know, we have to talk to them about it. Um, so I think there, these, these pictures do become this kind of currency among not always boys, but mostly boys. I mean, we have to tell it like it is, and this is not boy bashing, but we have to talk to them about this and why they think this, this, why why these things become this way the, the very early in my book actually in the first chapter there's a girl who's asked to send nudes by a boy and you know she goes through all these she goes through all these thoughts about oh wow wow why does he want nude pictures of me he just sort of simply demands of her send nudes you know and this is not uncommon honestly it's really not that uncommon an occurrence in a young girl's life at this stage to be asked for nude pictures by, from a boy just send nudes. She doesn't even know him very well. Oh, does he think I'm pretty? Does he want to be my boyfriend? Um, why does he want nude pictures of me? What kind of nude picture would I send? I mean, is this really the kind of thoughts we want going through a 13-year-old's head? And it turns out that when she asks him, why do you want these pictures of me? He says, well, I want to trade them first to some older boys for liquor, for alcohol. Yeah, it goes back to that currency. And I think in that same story in your book, that was the first chapter, you talk about how that same guy was nice for a small period of time, and then he he slowly you know groomed her and flipped the script and said, "Okay, now I need for you to send these news for currency." Yeah, and I I mean you can kind of if you think about it, if you can think back to when you were a teenager, you can kind of see how these things happen sometimes. You know, people ask me, "Why do these girls send these news?" Well, for one thing, their culture is telling them in myriad ways that the way that you get attention is to be sexual and to be sexualized. And I mean, from the celebrities, advertising, you know, uh, television, I, every, the sexualization of women and girls in our media is just so pervasive now. And it's even more pervasive on phones, on social media, all day long in their hands. They're carrying around these images of 
quote unquote hot girls getting attention and likes and friends and followers because they look hot. Kim Kardashian sending, you know, posting naked pictures of herself. She's got 50 million plus followers on Instagram. So, you know, they're, they're highly sexualized. So why, why do these girls, you know, send these pictures? Why would they do this? Well, just think back to when you were a teenager and it's, you know, two o'clock in the morning, you're lying in bed. You're, well, you're not asleep because you've been staring at the blue light of your phone and, and it's activating your brain in ways that make it hard for you to fall asleep. And we know that kids are losing sleep because of these phones. I mean, that is documented. So um, you're having a texting, sexting conversation with a boy in your class who reached out to you because who knows? He thinks you're pretty. He thinks you're cute, whatever you, you hope. And he starts saying, you know, uh, send me some naked pictures. I won't show anyone. Well, it's in the middle of the night. You're both horny, lonely, bored, can't fall asleep, and you kind of want love. It's really not that. It's, it's really not that surprising that these things get sent. You know. Um, but and, then, I think, and I think one of the things you talked about in the book. Uh, I think the, the ladies, the young girl's name was Brienne, and you talked about this whole Instagram culture where she was sitting in her mirror trying to figure out how to take the correct booty shot uh, to put on Instagram to kind of to get that attention that she was looking for. A lot of girls in the book talk about um, this emphasis on boobs and butts, and these are the words that they use. They say, you got to have a big boobs, got to have a big butt. And this is, you know, I think probably directly related to the focus on porn and the, you know, porn, pornography and the access to pornography, which is, it's been, pornography has been on the internet since day one. We know this, but it's become more accessible and more accessible to children and teenagers through phones, through, through the proliferation of phones and social media. Social media is just a wash in porn. If your kid is on social media, they're probably seeing porn at some point. There's no filter on Twitter. Twitter feeds are just, you know, there's a lot of advertisements for porn. Tumblr, which a lot of kids like to go on to for all kinds of reasons. They post all kinds of things about things they like, pictures of their, I don't know, artwork, etc. Well, it's also just almost like a porn site. If you Google Tumblr porn, you will find, unfortunately, just, I don't know how many links, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of porn links. Um so the porn aesthetic is that body type. And I really think that this is exactly what we're seeing here, where now girls feel this pressure essentially to look like porn stars. As crazy as that sounds, what else can you think when you hear girls talking over and over? And this is all kinds of girls in all kinds of places. Yeah, you have to have a big butt. You have to have a big boobs or you're not, uh, you're not hot. So, I mean, these are these are crazy things for kids so young and so sometimes so little. Sometimes, I mean, you know, a thirteen year old can can look very grown up, or she can look like a tiny little girl. Like sometimes these girls who are talking to me, telling me these things, look like really like children. You know, the book starts at thirteen, but a thirteen year old can look very young, and yet they're still talking about how. Yeah, you have to have this. You have to have big boobs and a big butt and all this stuff, and it's just a, it's just terrible pressure on them. And I, I talk a lot in the book also about how this pressure to to look like a porn star um, affects their sexuality too. You know, because if they don't feel that they measure up and they don't feel that they look right, quote unquote, then they they become even more you know, uncomfortable with their own, own bodies in a sexual context when they get older. Now, has that led to any rewards for the girls? Like, has it been a situation where they've gotten the attention they're looking for, or maybe they've gotten some type of modeling contract or, you know, some other type of publicity by posting pictures on Instagram and those types of places? Well, they see all over the place that girls do. I mean, I hate to mention Kim Kardashian again, but that's a perfect example. I mean, that's yeah. sort of the the... That's she's sort of the jewel in the crown of this problem, you know. I mean, that's exactly how she became. Uh, she was she's been highly rewarded for you know essentially being a porn star. And I'm not using that as a way to shame her or put her down. If you go on Pornhub, which is the biggest porn site 
uh, in the world, uh, there, if you search for porn stars, you know, top porn stars, she's one of them. She's listed as a porn star. And her, you know, she continues to sort of promote herself through this, again, like porn aesthetic. And they see, yeah, I mean, girls, you know, girls that I, I spoke to all over the place, in any community of girls, there's always this girl that they know, either in their school or in, in, in their community, who's quote unquote insta famous. And depending on the school, the community, this can mean she has tens of thousand followers. It can mean she has just like several hundred. But to them, it's famous because that's another thing that we haven't really talked about yet is the emphasis on fame, the focus on fame. Kids want to be famous and social media has put and smartphones have put in their hands these tools with which they feel like they can become famous, even if it's just through having a few hundred followers. They feel they have fame. And what gets you this kind of fame not always, but typically it's through some kind of sexualized persona. Now, have you seen girls seek their fame through like things that are not sexualized? Like, you know, I know for, you know, for a, a small amount of time, there are a lot of girls that would get into a lot of fights on social media, on social media, like Twitter, places like that. There was the, the star Keisha moment on Twitter where that, that you know, still happens a lot. Yeah. That, that was all over the place. Do you see that where, where girls are actually looking for fame through fighting opposed to sexualized images? I heard from, um, I heard from girls in several different places that a lot of fights start on social media, particularly Facebook. Now there's this idea that kids don't use Facebook anymore, but that's, that's really not true. They do. Um, they don't use it as much or in the same way that adults do. They've kind of moved off it onto more like onto Snapchat and Instagram for, I would say, their their daily or hourly usage. But they still have Facebook accounts. You still need a Facebook account for a lot of things and uh, to, to, to get other types of accounts. So they've kept their accounts. They're on there. And um, they use it a lot for dating and flirting and, you know, for example, if someone likes your profile picture on Facebook, that is a big thing and so forth. But yeah, there are still there are still um, fights that break out. I heard a lot because of Facebook and Twitter, uh, sometimes Instagram, but where somebody will post a picture of themselves and somebody will post a, a mean comment. And that mean comment will grow into some kind of huge fight. Right. And then at the end of this fight, somebody will say, well, meet me after school tomorrow morning and we're just going to, you know, we're going to fight it out. And then they will go and have this fight. And because it's been public and because it's been on Facebook and everyone knows it's going to happen, then everybody shows up with their phone and films it and then puts that on Facebook or some or YouTube. If you if you uh, go on YouTube and uh, search for girls fighting at school or girl fight at school, there's. I don't know how many, but there's tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of links. I have it in my book. And it's really disturbing because you see these girls um, being very brutal with each other. And it's filmed, it's posted, it stays there forever. Typically it's, again, not boy bashing, but this is just the case. Typically it's boys filming. And the boys often have a running commentary where they're either laughing or making fun of the girls for fighting. It's, uh, I think, another aspect of how social media is used in this really misogynistic way. And I think it's one of the things that parents may not understand, that the fights are actually taking place in the physical realm. It's no longer just fights on the internet or kids saying uh, things, you know, towards each other, traditional cyberbullying, that this stuff is really taking place in the streets and the communities that take place first on social media. Like, they realize fights are taking place now. Yeah, and our culture really um, encourages this among among women and girls. It's a terrible thing that I write about. It's a terrible thing. And I write about it in the book where you have shows like Bad Girls Club or Real Housewives or there's there's all these TV shows and reality TV shows that promote – an idea of women and girls as being hostile to each other, as catfighting, as backstabbing, right. as being jealous and hateful, and sometimes actually physically fighting. And some of these shows show girls, you know, and women really walloping each other and hurting each other. And uh, I spoke with um, 
Janine Amber, who's this great journalist, and she she she's written about reality TV and its effect on children and teenagers. And she said that you know, in a lot of these reality shows, that in their contracts, they have written into their contracts that you know um, they will they will follow the lead of the producers and the directors. In other words, these things are scripted. They're right. not, these things don't naturally occur. And so then on the set, the producers will, will suggest that they have a fight and they know that they get more, get more attention if they, if they engage in this sort of fighting and sort of go after each other. And these are shows that girls watch and sometimes they think it's real. There was a, um, study by the Girl Scouts of America that showed that, you know, majority of, of teenagers who watch these shows think it's real. They yes. think this is how women and girls behave. Right. And not knowing that if you don't get into a fight or you're not aggressive on these shows, and more than likely they'll drop you going into the next season. Exactly. If you don't have any drama. Now, this switching towards some of like the positive things in the book is – uh, one of the things I know that's really hit home for me and my daughter and, and my nieces is, is like, you know, this uh, phenomenon of doing like haul videos on YouTube. And you talked about uh, a couple of girls like Bethany Mata who started, you know, doing these YouTube videos of showing makeup products and how like she took off and became like, you know, a social media star. Uh, have you started seeing the trend like a lot of girls like, you know, doing these sorts of videos on like YouTube in order to pass time away and to have fun. I mean, like you know, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not. Look, like they say, you can't knock the hustle. Like I'm not. I'm not looking down on these girls for doing what they have to do to sometimes, you know, feel feel that they have to do to make money or get ahead. And you don't want to put down anybody for their success. It's not that. What it is is that it's like success because of what and success how. Because when you look at it, the YouTube stars <clears throat> who are really stars now. I mean, social media stars are bigger stars now to kids than stars in Hollywood and even in the music world. Social media is where kids are finding their role models. And if you look at the top successful uh, performers or celebrities or people who get attention on YouTube. When you look at the men and the the males, it's comedians, singers, sort of you know guys who who make jokes or do funny stunts or you know all, all different kinds of things that they're doing. With girls and women, it's almost exclusively beauty gurus. What they do, I mean, there are there are women who do other things on YouTube. That's true. And I don't want to diminish that, but overwhelmingly just in terms of numbers and, and, in, and the kind of success that really means something in the real world in terms of, you know, monetizing it, it's beauty gurus. They get money for attracting followers to watch them put on makeup. These are girls and young women who teach your daughter how to put on makeup and how to shop and wear clothes. Now, this is, again, nothing new. I mean, there's been this sort of, like, beauty advice going back in, in magazines I found when I researched to, you know, the 1800s. You know, there's not – there's always been this sort of uh, media and advertising, uh, you know, connection between, like, oh, I know. Like, let's let's make women feel like they need to be more beautiful so we can sell them some stuff to make them look more beautiful so – here, you know, let's like give them lots of advice about how to be more beautiful, and then we can sell them stuff. Well, that's exactly what this is. It's just that now it's on your daughter's computer, and now it's in on her cell phone, and now it's a girl who seems a girl like her sitting in her bedroom telling your daughter how to do a smoky eye or do the perfect eyebrow or get her eyebrows on fleek. Right, yeah. right. There's not there's nothing inherently wrong with that except that it becomes part of this undue focus on image and looks i don't mean to compare myself at all or say that i'm perfect you know my life has never been perfect either and i'm not a perfect person i'm just trying to compare one time to another recently i found a picture of myself when i was 14 and it was notable how my eyebrows were not on fleek. <laughs> my, <laughs> my eyebrows i mean i i don't think i would have even noticed that 
said that it was so striking how caterpillary my eyebrows looked. You know, they were just like these huge, bushy things. But what was I doing back in those days when I was not watching beauty gurus and YouTube videos and thinking about my eyebrows? I was reading books. I read books almost every day and and was just obsessed with reading. Um, nobody ever told me that I needed to have perfect eyebrows and I never really thought about it and never worried about it. And the kinds of things I was interested in doing were like playing soccer and reading books and hanging out with my friends. And I bemoan the fact that so many girls now are given this idea that they must spend so much time thinking about things like their eyebrows and their makeup and their booty and, you know, all these kind of things, because this is, this is taking time, valuable time that they have as as children to develop themselves in other ways, particularly girls. So is there one, you know, thing that, you know, before we leave uh, in regards to advice that you would give the parents after, you know, interviewing all these girls across the globe? You know, what would be that one advice tip that you would give parents out there when it comes to girls and social media? talk to them about what is going on on their phones. And I know that that sounds simple and I know that doesn't sound like much of an, much in the way of advice, but I think it's the best advice you can give at this point. Talk to them and not, not talk at them, but talk to them. Try to get them talking to you. Try and do what I did, which is to get them to tell you about what's going on on those phones and what's happening and how they feel about it not just what's happening but how they feel about it because that's really what they need to be talking to somebody about because a lot of it's very confusing uh they feel rudderless they feel so so social media is like a lot of times i think it feels to kids like like lord of the flies like the wild west like there's just no rules and they say this to me in the book there's no rules there's no boundaries there's no guidelines they don't have uh a any kind of precedent for this and neither do we they don't have us sitting there and telling them well you know back when i was a girl when i was cyber bullied this is what i did you know because we didn't experience that and and they they don't have anybody right now to tell them what to do and as a girl in my book says we will want our parents to tell us what to do and that doesn't mean you have to be dictatorial or harsh or mean or snatch away their phone or, 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 or yell at them. It's just like there's so many moments in their lives now in which they face moral and ethical dilemmas and they don't know what to do. Like when they see someone else being cyberbullied, what do I do? Or uh, when someone asks them for nude pictures, what do I do? You know, they need to talk to you about it. They need to talk to their parents about it. They need to know what you think about it. And the more um, loving and non-judgmental these these conversations can be, I think the better. The more you listen, the better. But they need to come to you because they they want someone to be there with them in this this new world that they're experiencing. I think that's great advice, Nancy. So where can people find your book? Well, um, it's it's on Amazon. It's on uh, barnesandnoble.com. It's on indie books, in, indie, indie bound. It's on the internet. It's in bookstores. Um, I'm, I've been really, really uh, touched and moved by people sending me pictures of my book Um uh, <laughs> on social media, actually, They'll, the people are posting pictures of my book. They've seen on sale all over the place in Seattle, Washington, and um, Sydney, Australia, and you know all different places. And they they post it and they like at me. I mean, social media isn't all bad. Sometimes we're just being friendly with each other, and and I know that. And this is one of those cases where it's been it's been really sweet of people to show me. So they see my book somewhere. So I, I think it's on sale. Um, Probably wherever you find books. Okay. What about social media? Where can people find you on your social media channels? Uh, well, I'm on Twitter at Nancy Joe Sale. It's just like it sounds. N a n c y j o s a l e s. And I've um, I was not a big t- tweeter before the book came out, but I've been trying to let people know about things that are happening in the world 
of, of social media, girls, and that's mainly what I do on there. I'm on Instagram, again, Nancy Jo Sales. Um, yeah, and I have a website, too, where if you have any questions or anything you want to ask me or tell me, uh, or if you feel like you'd like me to come speak at your school or in your community, it's possible we could we could do that through my publisher. And my website is nancyjosales.com. Well, once again, Nancy, thanks for being on the show. We'll put all those links up in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you you so much. Hey, parents, I hope you really enjoyed that episode with Nancy Jo and all of her great detail in this book talking about teenage girls and their online behavior. And remember, if you really need Nancy Jo to come out to your community to talk to your school, make sure you go to the Digital Parent Podcast website to get her contact information. And you can also get her social handles as well. And make sure you please leave us a review on this episode. Let us know how you feel and what you thought about the episode or what we could do to improve. And also, please make sure you subscribe to the Digital Parent Podcast. Thanks.